we praise God one more time. Can we do it one more time? I've got to tell you something. Um, I know you think we coordinate all of this stuff, and we don't. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, if you could just take a guess at what's being preached today. Let me give you a hint. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God has a way of just bringing all that together and working it all out. He put it in my heart. I've been wanting to preach on this for years, and God kept telling me, no, it's not time. No, not yet. No, not yet. No, not yet. And this week, he said, this is it. So here we go. <laughs> First off, really quick, I just got a note that Miss Marlene, um, many of you guys know her, um, her daughter had a stroke and is in Georgia and asked for us to be praying for her. So we're going to pray before the service starts. We'll be praying for her. So just keep her in your prayers. So let's go ahead and pray now. Father, I thank you for your presence, the manifestation of your presence that is already here. God, I thank you that you set things in order. You orchestrate things far above our ways. And God, I just thank you, God, for just being an awesome God, for being present here. God, we ask that your spirit would not dwindle, God, that it would continue to grow in this service today. God, we have not seen anything yet. What you're going to do at the end of this service is going to blow us away. I have faith, and I believe that's what you're going to do. Father, we lift up Miss Marlene's daughter. God, we just ask, Lord, that all the bleeding would stop. God, we ask that you would heal her brain right now. Touch that part of her body right now that's causing her to have these strokes. God, we ask for the oxygen to be able to flow to her brain right now. Let it flow, Father, in Jesus' name. And, Father, we also ask you, Lord, to use me as your vessel. God, pour into me so that I can pour out to your people. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. amen. There's a story of a young man. He was, everything was going great in his life. He was getting ready to graduate from high school and just got a scholarship to earn, actually earned a scholarship for Bright Futures. Many of you guys have heard of that, to go on to college. And everything was great. And his father decided, you know what, I'm going to bless my son. He's got good grades and all of that. I want to bless him. I want to buy him a new truck for a graduation present. So they went out. It was a Saturday morning. They went out and they went to several different dealerships looking at vehicles, trying to pick out and decide what he wanted and all that kind of thing. And how many of you guys know that a day can start out ordinary, but can turn to tragedy like that? Amen. Went on throughout the day. They decided to stop for lunch, and they stopped for lunch, and, and everything was great. They went home, and mind you, it's Saturday, so men in the house, help me out with this. What do we do on Saturday afternoons? I heard a few of them. We take a nap. And if you're serious about your nap time, you get in your recliner and you put on a Western because Westerns just put you to sleep like that. I don't know what it is, but they just do it. Well, that's exactly what this young man's father normally did on Saturdays. And typically what would happen during this time is he knew that his father was going to take a nap. So what would he do? Their house was two stories. And so he would go upstairs, do homework, play a video game play around while his dad took a nap in the living room. But this time, he got to the first step of the stairs, put his foot down, and the Word of God spoke to him and said, not today, stay downstairs. And he thought, okay. So he sat down on the sofa, and about 30 minutes later, he was figuring out exactly why God told him, don't go upstairs. About 30 minutes later, he found his father hunched over in his recliner and asked him, what's going on? And he said, I've got immense pain in my chest and my arm. I don't know what's going on. He stood up and walked around and was feeling better, but still wasn't 100%. Went outside to get fresh air. Still didn't work. And his father looked at him and said, what do you think is going on? And the son said, it sounds like, because he took health science classes, it sounds like you're having a heart attack, and I think we need to get you to the hospital. And so ended up getting him to the hospital, did an EKG, and they find out that, yes, you've had a massive heart attack within the last hour. And they rush him back to triage. His son is blown away. Everything was great, and just in a blink of an eye, everything turns. 
Just like that, that dramatically. How many of you know that's how life is sometimes? Life dishes us things that we can't prepare for, we don't foresee. But the amazing thing is the Holy Spirit's right there and says, hush, peace, be still. Be still. I've got this all under control. They rush him back to triage. They begin hooking things up, IVs. They're not saying anything. We've had prob- they probably had around five to, five to eight doctors rush in, and all this stuff is going on, and no one's saying a word, asking questions. They say, just trust us. Everything's okay. We got this. And then they come to find out. They say, okay, we're going to have to do a catheterization to see what's going on because there must be some blockage. They take him back, and, of course, this man's father says, go ahead and get your mother because don't call her on the phone because she's probably not, she's going to be distraught and won't be able to make it. Just go pick her up and bring her here. Well, by the time they got back, he was already out of operation, and the doctors came out and said, three of his arteries are blocked, 90 to 99%. We had to put a stent in one just to keep him alive. And so now, what are we going to do from this point forward? The doctors talk, and they say, you know, you need open-heart surgery. They schedule it for the following Monday. So they wanted to sit in the hospital. The reason being is because he's had a heart attack. They want his heart to cool down because they said his heart was hot. It had been through a lot. So they give him a week to chill. And then Saturday morning, this son and his mother are getting ready, it's about 7 o'clock, to leave their house to go to the hospital where he's at. And they get a phone call, and it's from the hospital. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. And how many of you know that's never a good thing? And it's their husband, father, and he says, hurry quick, I'm having another one. They get there, and by the time they get there, they're rushing him down to do another catheterization and come to find out the stent that they put in has now collapsed and now he's had another heart attack. And now they're faced with a dilemma. The doctors pull in the son and the wife, and they say, here's what we're dealing with. His heart is hot. That's why we were trying to wait before we did surgery. But now he's had two heart attacks. If we wait, he will die. He will have another heart attack, and that will be the end. If we do surgery there's a 50-50 chance that he may not wake up. What do you want to do? And they're looking now at the wife and the son saying, you make the decision. They decided, well, we're going to put our faith in God. God's going to come through, do the surgery. They did the surgery, and he came out, and they come in to see him in recovery, and he's as white as a sheet, and they begin to question, did we make the right call? How many of you have been there in those situations? And on the other side of something, you question, well, God, I thought I heard you, but was this really you? On the way home, the son is driving from the hospital, and, of course, he's pouring his heart out to God, saying, God, why have you left me? Why have you forsaken me? What is this? You didn't prepare me for this. And right there in that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke again and said, be quiet, listen. And on the radio at that exact moment were these lyrics. This is where the healing begins. This is where the healing starts. When you come to where you're broken within, the light meets the dark. The light meets the dark. The name of that song is Healing Begins. Have you ever experienced a time when your life intersected with someone else and they seemed to know exactly what you needed to hear at exactly the right time. You may not have ever met them, but it seemed like they had known you for your entire life. Have you ever witnessed another Christian that seems to have this amazing gifting? They walk up to someone and completely read their life story. Their prayers have power behind them. You feel something jumping inside you when they lay hands and pray on you. Maybe you felt an enormous heat come over your entire body. Have you ever wondered why when they pray, it seems like all of heaven stops and listens? Chances are, if you experience this, when you are at the end of your rope, like I'm sure everyone in here has been at one point in time, they are the very first ones that you call. Why? Because you know they're going to get through to God. You know they're going to pray. If you're here this morning and any of this rings true for you, this message this morning is for you. Today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that details the initiation of the Holy Spirit's indwelling 
and his people as a whole. Before we dive in the passage, I want us to cover some of the context surrounding it. Directly before the passage we're going to study, which is Acts 2, we see that Jesus is with the disciples after he had been raised from the dead. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he remained with the disciples for 40 days. During this time, we see an interaction in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And you can turn there in your Bibles. It's Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Let me go ahead and prepare you now. We are going to be reading a lot of Scripture. So if I can right now, how many of you love Scripture? You love the Bible? Okay, good. In about uh, 30 minutes, I'll remind you of that, that you committed to that. So just so we're all clear, so don't, don't hate me, all right? On one occasion, while he, namely Jesus, was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. There Jesus, he's shifting the topic again, going back to what he originally said. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Notice that in this interaction, Jesus says they have spoken about this promise before. So I want us to turn to see when, God, when Jesus first promised this gift. And it's John 14, 15 through 21. John 14, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live in you, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. So this is why, when we get into Acts 2, this is why we find the disciples waiting in what the scriptures call the upper room. It's because of what Jesus said right here. Because in Acts 2, Jesus has been taken up into heaven, and Jesus told them, do not leave Jerusalem until this promise has come, and it will come on you. The last item we need to explore, and this is awesome, and again, it's, we see it taking place even in the service today. We need to explore the timing that this took place according to the calendar. Because it's really awesome when you look at the timing of everything that God orchestrated to make everything line up just perfect. In the first verse of Acts, it is recorded that this took place on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was an annual feast celebrated on the day after the seventh Sabbath after Passover, according to Leviticus 23, 15 through 16. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to turn to Leviticus. Um, how many of you love to read the book of Leviticus? Okay, we agree. There it is if you want to turn there. More than welcome to. In other words, the day of Pentecost was 50 days after the Passover. Pentecost was one of three major annual feasts celebrated by the Jews. Jesus was crucified at Passover time, and he ascended 40 days after his resurrection. Now stay with me. There's going to be a lot of numbers thrown at you here. I just want you to see the timeline. The Holy Spirit came 50 days after the resurrection, 10 days after Jesus ascended. So 10 days after Jesus ascended, the promise came. Now that we understand some of the context, let's go ahead and dive into the passage that we're studying today, our main one, Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and we're going to jump around a little bit. I'm going to skip over some things, not because it's not important, but just for time's sake. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Verse 5. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Why is this? Because of the season. They're all there together. 
Now, let me just point something out to you. Let's just back up. Jesus had to die at just the right time. He had to be buried. He had to be in the ground for three days, rise on the third day, and had to be with them a certain amount of days, 40 days, and ascend for everything to line up just perfectly for the timing of this. And you'll see why here in just a second. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own native language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? They're speaking in languages they don't even know. They've never spoken in before. And yet here, this promise has come, and now they're speaking all these other languages. And these other people who are there recognize it. They recognize that it's their native language. Drop down to verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up. Oh, faithful Peter. Always right there to jump in. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, going all the way back in the Old Testament. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's a sermon right there in itself. Let's jump down to verse 37. When the people heard this, that this is, again, Peter preaching here. When they heard his sermon, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept his message were baptized and about 3,000, did you hear that? About 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000. Wouldn't that be an awesome move of God if we come in here next Sunday and there were 3,000 people in here? One thing for sure, it'd be standing room only. But that's not a problem. For this sermon, I have one and only one point to get across to you this morning, and it is this. I have no other application point. I have nothing. This is what we're focusing on today. If you think the Holy Spirit is absent today, think again. He's alive and well and willing to work in our midst. And we've seen a manifestation already this morning. He's here. He's available. The question is, do you want to receive him? Do you want him? The title of the message this morning is, The Promise Remains. There are three baptisms I want us to look at today. We're going to do something different. Pastor Daniel in the sound booth has been gracious enough to help me. I'm fairly decent with technology, but without a doubt, he's better than I am. So we're going to try this. It worked in the first service, and I'm going to draw out some things for you. And you'll see it on the screen here in just a second. Try this again. There we go. Did the same thing in the first service. All right. We want to talk about three baptisms here. And we're going to go through the scriptures and we're going to see that clearly there are three baptisms available to us. The first one is the Holy Spirit baptizes us in Jesus. Now, what is that? That's salvation. We get baptized into the body of Christ. We become one with Jesus. The second one is the disciple baptizes us in water. 
What is that? That's when we get water baptized. That's the one we're all familiar with. We don't think about salvation as a baptism, but it truly is a baptism. You're being baptized. You're saying, I'm going to leave my old self behind. And that's what you're saying up here. You're just saying it publicly in front of everyone. The third one I want us to focus on, and this is the one we're going to focus on mainly today. Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. So many people, they stop right here at this one right here. They say, I got what I need. And you're right, you'll get into heaven. But let me ask you something. If there was something more, if I said, I'll give you $20, I'll give you $100, how many would be foolish enough to say, oh, I'll just take the 20? I mean, I know I'm getting real simple here, but that's exactly what we're talking about. We're just going to make it really simple. I'm very simple-minded. That's exactly what God's offering us today. He said, you can have this, or you can have this. I don't know about you, but if the Holy Spirit comes in my life, and he promises to make my life just a little bit easier, not perfect, but a little bit easier, I want all of them I can get. I want all of them I can get. Now, here's the thing I want us to notice. I want us to notice the difference between the first one and the third one. This first one here, because so many people get confused by this, and this, this is the key here. This here is a baptism of. This third one right here is a baptism in or with. That I'm a grammatic, I'm a grammarian. I love to, whenever someone says something, I listen exactly to what they're saying because words count and the way they say it counts. And so, what I want you to see here is that if I were to ask you, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? In other words, have you received the baptism that the Holy Spirit performs, namely salvation? Many of you today would hopefully respond with, yes, that's salvation. So we got number one. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. But the Bible also talks about the baptism in or with the Holy Spirit. This third one right here. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Now, what I want us to do is I want us to jump around in some scriptures and see this in action. So let's jump to Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. And this is John the Baptist speaking here. And it reads this, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Notice very carefully, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to remember in your mind, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It stated, by the Spirit, we are baptized into the body of Christ. Do you notice the difference in language here? We have a difference of language here. And I want you to notice that and pick it up because you're going to see that throughout. So number one, again, the Holy Spirit baptizes us with Jesus, but notice very carefully in Matthew 3.11, he, Jesus, will baptize you with or in, both articles are the same in the Greek, the Holy Spirit. Now listen to me carefully. Theologically, these two cannot be the same. There's, but there's another thing that gets to me. Grammatically, these two cannot be the same. I don't care how you dice it, theologically or grammatically, These two baptisms cannot be the same. There's no way. Why? Because you have two different subjects. You have two totally different subjects. Jesus wants to immerse us, completely surround us, get us completely filled with, to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want us to see this is the third baptism or the baptism in the Holy Spirit is present in every single gospel. And we're going to walk through it right now. Normally, I don't do this, but I want us to go through every single gospel and see this taking place and see this taking shape. Now, one thing I want to point out, the book of John is not one of the synoptic gospels. And the reason being is you have Mark, Luke, and Luke, and Matthew. What I want you to notice here is that with John, he wrote that way after the gospels were written, the synoptic gospels. Why? Because later on in his life, he began to realize, he looked back and he said, Oh my goodness, the Synoptic Gospels, they go from the birth of Jesus, the childhood of Jesus, and they spring forward then to the last year of his ministry, death, burial, resurrection, and that's it. They don't cover everything he did in the first two years of his ministry. And he thought, if we don't write this down, 
Generations to come will, will not even know about everything he did in those two years of his life. So John, we're going to see John here when we read it. It's a little bit different. So here, let's go out right here. John, before he was beheaded, began to think that if none of these miracles were recorded that took place in Jesus' first two years of ministry, then how will they know about it? So let's go first to Mark 1.8. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We see two different baptisms going on here. What do you have to do in order to be baptized in water? First, you've got to receive salvation. So there's all three baptisms taking place there. Turn to Luke chapter 3, 16. He answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Got different baptisms going on here. Finally, turn to John 1, 33. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now notice, again, a grammarian here. Notice that he said descend and remain, because this is critical. And this, this, this shows that there's a shift taking place here in history. Because the Holy Spirit had never descended and remained on a person until this point. We see the Holy Spirit moving, but we never see it descending and remaining on one person. The Holy Spirit descended on people in the Old Testament, but he never remained. If you remember, he descended on King Saul, but when Saul offered the sacrifice without Samuel present, the Holy Spirit left him. If you remember, he descended upon David then, and then when David committed adultery with Bathsheba, in his prayer of repentance in Psalm 51, David says this, Take not thy spirit from me, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Now the Father says to John, Who you see the Spirit descending and remaining, that is who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now when do we see John see the Spirit descend and remain on Jesus? It was when he was water baptized. Immediately after, you've all seen the movies, I'm sure, and I've got a story to go along with this, and I have a bit of a problem with this because they showed the dove coming down. Now, here's my problem with this. Do the scriptures say the Holy Spirit is a dove, or do they say the Holy Spirit like a dove? It says like a dove. That's my only problem with this because we, we, we imitate the Holy Spirit as being, like a, being a dove. That's not what it says at all. Matter of fact, there's a comical story that goes along with this. A pastor was getting ready to preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they had just gone through remodeling, remodeling their church, and right above the pulpit, there was an open space where an air vent used to be. And he thought, you know, it'd be really cool if I can shove someone up there, give them a dove, and when I say, the Holy Ghost come down, if they throw the dove down. What better to get to do the job besides a young boy? So he finds a young, willing boy, probably from World Rangers, gets the ladder, gets him up there, gives him a dove, and he gives him the instructions. So he gets to the point in his sermon, the critical point, and he says, the Holy Spirit came down. <laughs> Nothing. He said, I said, the Holy Spirit came down. Nothing. And he said, well, maybe he's just not hearing me. Let me be a little bit louder this time. I said, the Holy Spirit came down. And then in a very shy voice, he hears the boy say, Pastor, the cat ate the, ate the Holy Ghost. You want me to throw the cat down instead? <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> So I have a very simple question for you. If, you. if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, if he needed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit when he was on this earth, don't you think that we need it today? Amen. Maybe you're better than I am, and I'm sure you are, but let me tell you that my life may not be perfect with the Holy Spirit, but my life sure is a whole lot easier. Now I want us to look back at this board here really quick. I want you to look at these three words that's up here. We have salvation, 
water, and spirit. That's the three baptisms we're talking about here. Now, real quick, before we look at more scriptures with these three baptisms in it, is Jesus our example? Would you say Jesus is our example? I've got to tell you something, and I'm going to sit here just for a minute. I get really annoyed whenever I see people idolizing themselves after humans instead of their creator. You know that show, Keep It Up With The Kardashians? You know what I would like to see? I would like to see us stop worrying about the Kardashians and start keeping up with God. Listen, there are great people in this world. I don't want to serve them. I want to serve who made them because he's much greater. So if we can just get our eyes off of all this stuff, all these people we idolize, the world will be such a much better place. Anyway, that was free. All right. First off, was Jesus saved? Well, yes and no. Did Jesus have sin in his life? No. So what did he need to be saved from? Nothing. See, here's the deal. Jesus didn't need to be, need to be reborn again because he was born right the first time. That's the difference between us and him. So he didn't need to be saved. So he skips ahead. All right. So when we are born, we are born into sin because we inherit the sins of our parents. But the perfect, the awesome thing is we were born, again, perfect children of God. We had the same standing that Jesus had because of his blood. We are made perfect in God's eyes. I am perfect in my position before God, even though I'm not perfect in my performance because I stand in Christ. So Jesus was a child of God. Then he was water baptized, and then he, re- then he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. So turn back to Acts 1, and I want you to notice this same sequence, salvation, water, and spirit baptisms. This is one after we see the promise come. We see these three things taking place in Scripture. Acts 2, 37. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Now I want you to watch for the three baptisms. Here they come. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here we go. Repent and be baptized. Then you will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All three. Notice, repent, get saved, be baptized, water baptism, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me clarify something before we move on. So many people think, and this is, this is our fault as a Pentecostal church, so many people think that tongues is the Holy Spirit, and it's not. The tongues is simply a gift of the Holy Spirit. There are many gifts of the Holy Spirit, and there's so many confusion, so much confusion. Let me illustrate this for you. If I said, Gator, we appreciate everything you do for us at Oxford Assembly. We're going to throw you a big banquet. And I know that Gator's like me. He's a carnivore. He likes his meat. If you put, if you give me a choice between oak wood ribs and a cake, which one do you think I'm going to go for every single time? Hello, Oakwood. Thank you. I got a witness. So if I said, Gator, we're going to have a banquet for you, And it's going to be just for you. And at this banquet, I'm going to give you a watch. I'm going to give you this watch right here. And we go to this banquet, and it comes time to give him the watch. And then I hand out, and I say, here you go. Here's the gift of the watch. But I only gave him the minute hand. He would say, I thought you were going to give me the gift of the watch. And I say, no, this is a part of the gift. You'll get the other part when you work for more 50 more years. You've got to keep working, brother. Don't, Don't stop now. I don't want to, I don't want to get you too, too amped up here, too prideful. So many people, they think that the tongues is the Holy Spirit. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit, a sign that they have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, look at verse 39, because this is critical. Many, many people, I've heard this so much here lately, and this is the go-to scripture that I go to, and I want you to go to this one as well. Anytime you hear this, whenever people say, The Holy Spirit was only for the 120 that were present that day. It's it's crystal clear. I'm not making this up. We're going to read exactly what the Word of God says, and then you tell me what you think. Verse 39 of Acts 2. 
The promise, what is the promise? The Holy Spirit is for you, that's them, and your children, the next generation, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Guess who that is? That's us. This promise is for us today, just like it was for them back then. It's here. It's available. And we're not tapping into it. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 8, verse 12. Philip goes to Samaria, preaches, and let's see if they receive the three baptisms. But when they believed Philip, so their salvation, they believed the message he was preaching... As he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now they got water baptized. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. But they had simply been baptized into the, into the Lord Jesus. Now, wait a minute. Why would Peter and John, apostles of God, go and pray for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit if they already had the Holy Spirit? It's crazy. It's like the Bible doesn't know our theology today. It's crazy. Let's look. It's crystal clear. Verse 17 then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Many, many believers have been saved, been baptized in water, but have not received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, I'd like for us to think about the Old Testament for a minute. The amazing thing is, in the Old Testament, we can see references to the three baptisms even there. While our Old Testament brothers and sisters would not have picked up on it, now that we have the full story, we can see it taking place. God was foreshadowing what he was going to do later on. So we're going to go back to the board here just for a second. I got these three words still up here, salvation, water, and spirit. Now, I'm going to do something very dangerous. I'm going to draw. In fifth grade, I got a, 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 a little certificate saying that I was a great artist, and I thought, hmm, you'll see here in just a second. I'm going to draw something. I can't believe y'all don't know what it is already. I'd... It's as clear as day, right? I already heard it. This is the tabernacle in the Old Testament. Now, what is this first square right here? This represents the altar. Now, what did they do there? That's where you get the blood of the lamb. Now, out of those three words up there, where would that fit in? Salvation. All right. Now, what is this second thing? So they go, they, they, they give the blood of the lamb, and they move on to the next step. I wonder what that step might be. That's called a laver. That's where they got washed. Huh. I wonder if that might represent water baptism. I wonder where this is headed. Now, what's the second, the third circle there? That's a flask where they had oil. They were to put that on before they went into the holy place and the most holy place as spirit baptism. Can I tell you something? This is what I see. I see people coming into the church, and they're told, you need to get saved. They go, okay, I'll get saved. They go through that process, and then they're told, okay, now you need to get water baptized. They say, okay, I can get water baptized. That's simple. I mean, you just dunk, dunk me underwater. That's okay. I'll do that. And in this third one, they're told, you need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they say, mm, I don't know. I've heard some things about that. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go around. I'm going to go right on into the presence of God. 
Can I tell you something? We don't go into the presence of God under our rules. We go under his presence and into his. We need to stop acting like God and skipping parts that he says we need to go through. We don't go into the presence of God under our rules. We go under them in his. Now, now that we understand that, this morning what I want to do is I want us to remain in an attitude of prayer. I'm going to play a song right now like I normally do, and I want you just to begin there, right there where you're at, pray, and say, God, if this is real, I ask that you reveal it to me. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to ask for all those that have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit to come forward at the altar, line up along the altar. And then for those that would like to receive, and listen to me, I'm not forcing this at all. I'm not going to force the issue. I'm simply making it available, just as God does. If you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then I'm going to call you to come forward and to line up along one of those that are already here that have it. Because at the end of the day, let me ask you something. If you ask me for a $20 bill, I didn't have a $20 bill, can I give you a $20 bill? I can't do it. That's why I'm asking for those that have received it to come forward to pray for those that want it. So remain in an attitude of prayer right where you are, and pray for God to reveal to you if this is true or not. If those that have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit would come forward and line up along this altar. Now, I want to say something very quickly. Do not be discouraged today if you do not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you a very quick story. I know we're running over. Very quick story. My grandmother, who passed away January 15th, told me this story. Whenever she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, she went to Pentecostal church, received the South Sea salvation, just knew something else was there, was available, and God impressed on her to go to a Pentecostal church. She went there on a Sunday night, and they talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just as God would have it, perfect timing. She went down forward, was prayed, nothing happened. She sought it for a year. Nothing happened, and she thought, something must be wrong with me. And then when she least expected it, a year later, she was cleaning her bathroom, not praying, not doing anything. She began speaking in tongues, was baptized with the Holy Spirit in her bathroom. No lie. Now, if you are here and you have other obligations to go to and you're not going to come down forward, you are dismissed. Don't feel like you have to remain here. But I want this to remain reverent for those that are here that want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So first off, those that are here that ever see the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'd like for you to find someone who has not and to begin praying for them. And we're going to believe God for an outpouring of His Spirit. That's what we're going to do this morning. If you want something different, you have to do something different. And if you want more of God, God's here and he's available. He's at this altar. All you've got to do is cry out to him. And he'll give it to you. That's the problem. We're not thirsty anymore. We're not thirsty. We just go through the, go through the ropes. So if you're here today and you want to receive more, 